Staffio Now is presented by Northwest Financial Advisors, where our world revolves around you. Hello, everyone. This is Jim Hughes with FEO Now. We are a program of recorded interviews with senior U.S. intelligence officers and those who write about them. Today, I have a fascinating guest. His name is Stuart Reed. He is an executive editor for Foreign Affairs Magazine. He's written articles for a number of publications, including The Atlantic, The New York Times, The Washington Post, Bloomberg, and Politico. He has a bachelor's degree in government from Dartmouth University. And he has a brand new book coming out later this month, which I've just read and thoroughly enjoyed. It's very well researched and written, and it vividly portrays a very dark chapter in the history of African independence. Stuart, welcome to AFIO Now. Thanks so so much for having me, Jim. I'm excited to be here. Jim, Stuart, as we were discussing off camera, this book is very rich in detail. What were some of your principal uh, information sources? So primarily it was archival documents. So... First and foremost, perhaps the CIA cables at the time, some of which were released by the State Department in a Foreign Relations of the United States volume, some of it which were part of the Church Committee investigation and slowly declassified over the years. But a lot of State Department documents, too, a lot of documents from the United Nations, which was intimately involved in the Congo crisis, some from the Belgian government. And then I really wanted to get the Congolese side of the story, too, and there's way less documentation there. And so to get that side, it was more memoirs, oral histories, even interviews with some of the children of the principal characters. Stuart, how did uh, Patrice Lumumba establish himself as a Congolese évolué and rise to prominence in the Congo? Yeah, so his rise is really remarkable, um, above all because it took place in this very cramped colonial context of the Belgian Congo, where the administration there really prevented educa- higher education, it prevented you know, freedom of expression. And so Patrice Lumumba, he, he was born in a very small town. And then like many African men in the 40s in, across the continent, migrated to a city. Um, the city he went to was Stanleyville, which is today Kisangani. And it was there that he really threw himself into reading and becoming a library member. And he's this um, incredible autodidact. And he also wrote furiously for various publications and joined association after association. And as you mentioned, he then earned a status called évolué, literally an evolved person, which was a, you got a card, the Belgian colonial administration gave you a card after certifying that you were up to, quote unquote, European standards. You know, they even, they would go to your home and see, did you have a proper toilet? Did you eat with a knife and fork? And Lumumba, you know, undertook the somewhat humiliating process of applying for this and and was granted it, one of the um, earlier Congolese to receive this status. And so what's interesting about his early career is he, you know, he was later known to be this anti-colonial agitator, but earlier on, he really played inside the system and tried to get close to various colonial officials and imagined a future for the Congo, where the King of Belgium was still the head of state. So only late in the 1950s did his views change quite quickly to become you know, the Lumumba we would come to know. What's the history of the relationship between Lumumba and Mobutu, and how did that develop over time? Yeah, so in many ways, the story I tell in my book is a story of a very personal betrayal. So J- Joseph Mobutu, he would later rename himself Mobutu Sese Seko and become this you know, cartoonish Central African dictator wearing a leopard skin hat and ruled for over 30 years of you know, the Congo and then renamed that Zaire. But uh, Mobutu of 1950s and 1960 was a very different man. And he was actually Lumumba's protege. So Lumumba was this nationalist leader and Mobutu was a journalist who wrote columns for a newspaper in Leopoldville, the capital. And they sort of met each other through journalistic political circles. And Lumumba took Mobutu on as basically a personal assistant. So 
when Lumumba went to Brussels, Mobutu was in charge of handling his correspondence and that sort of thing. And what, what, so then there was what we call the Congo crisis. And, you know, to make a long story short, the country becomes independent on June 30th, 1960 from Belgium. Within days, it's utter chaos. The army mutinies, two different provinces announce their secession. Uh, The Belgian military intervenes without permission across what is now their former colony. And the United Nations, Lumumba calls in the United Nations. So there's this moment of great chaos, this sort of traumatic birth as an independent nation. And Lumumba makes this very fateful appointment, which is he turns to Mobutu as the the army has mutinied. It had an all-white officer corps and the black rank and file, not surprisingly, was not too enthusiastic about that. And so Lumumba, you know, announced that he was firing all the white officers and appointing Mobutu to be in charge of the Africanization process of the military. So that Mobutu had a military background. He had served six or seven years in the colonial army, but uh, then Lumumba appointed him to this key position, which ended up changing the entire political history of this country. Why was Lumumba's uh, first visit to the United States considered so unsuccessful? Yeah, so in July 1960, Lumumba, you know, his country's falling apart. He's invited in UN peacekeepers, but they're not restoring order to his satisfaction. So he goes, he flies to New York to talk to Dag Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General of the UN, and lobby for sort of more aggressive UN intervention. And then he also goes to Washington, D.C. He wants to meet with President Eisenhower. As it happens, Eisenhower is out of town, so he can't get the presidential meeting. He's very disappointed about that. And he meets with the State Department, Secretary of State Christian Herter, and then Douglas Dillon, who was the number two official at the time. What's interesting about this meeting is, in retrospect, Douglas Dillon would testify before the church committee that he found Lumumba, quote, psychotic, and that he he said this was a man who is simply not rational. He had a tremendous flow of words and nothing made sense. That sort of became the standard view of this meeting. If you actually look at the transcript of the meeting, as I did, you'll see that it was a much more normal back and forth. And no one at the time contemporaneously said that Lumumba was being irrational or psychotic. In fact, to the contrary, the consensus was that he was more mild than expected. But be that as it May, on a substantive level, the meeting was a failure because what Lumumba wanted was aid and investment from the United States. And the United States was sort of wavering about Lumumba. It didn't quite know what to make of him. It didn't, in the Cold War context, he was not seen as, a, as reliably pro-American, in fact, potentially playing footsie with the Soviets. Ironically, of course, he was asking the Americans for aid, which is hardly a, something that a pro-communist leader would do. But so the Americans rebuffed him and said, no, 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 all aid that you want has to go through the UN. And that was, you know, so he didn't get what he wanted for. The other mistake he made was that in New York, he met with Soviet diplomats, which was, you know, in his view, I'm a leader of an independent country. I can meet with whoever I want. The Americans interpreted that as a sinister outreach to their rival. So he, he, his trip to both New York and D.C. utterly failed. He also went to Ottawa in Canada, and that was a failure, too. He, he rubbed everyone there the wrong way. But what I find interesting is Lumumba got, in my view, fundamentally miscategorized by the United States. He was neutral in the Cold War. He talked about wanting to chart an independent course for his country. He had cut his teeth agitating against the colonial power. He showed no interest in substituting that for domination by Washington or Moscow. But, and in fact, if you had to pick, I would argue he's more pro-American than pro-Soviet. He constantly talked to to any American official he could about how the United States was a fellow colonial nation that had become independent. He talked about he wanted Congolese students to go to school in America. He even, during his trip to Washington, D.C. at a press conference in the basement of Blair House, I believe. He called on the United States to send troops to Congo to reestablish order. So those are not the actions of someone who is in uh, the Soviet's pocket. 
What was President's attitude toward Lumumba, and how did that ultimately affect uh, U.S. policy? Yeah, so I think just to back up, I mean, Eisenhower himself was not particularly enthusiastic about African independence. In his memoir, he described the independence of all these nations, and especially in 1960, when 17 of them became independent, as this you know negative, torrential downpour. You know, he called it a hurricane, and he at another point said that. He didn't think these African nations should be allowed to join the United Nations. So he was a skeptic of African independence. This was a debate at the time, and he fell on the side of, you know, let's be slow, and these countries should take, you know, many years to finally become into transition to independent countries. So his context, you know, the broader context was he was not particularly excited about independence. Lumumba, in particular, I think, you know, offended his sense of decorum. Lumumba was fairly erratic, outspoken. He said one thing and then would do another thing the next day. He was you know, very much a politician. And the other aspect is I think Eisenhower, by virtue of his military experience during World War II, you know, he was he was in many ways naturally aligned with the European view of events. And so, you know, Belgium was a NATO ally. And Eisenhower was certainly not alone in thinking this of sort of the fundamental tension at the time was between, you know, all these African countries were becoming independent, but the United States had was allied with their European rulers. And so it was a balance of trying to navigate this tension between Europe, you know, do we align ourselves with Europe or the new independent countries of Africa? And that tension really played out in the Congo crisis and with regard to Lumumba. Tell our audience who Ralph Bunch was and what role did he uh, come to play in the Congo? Yeah, so he's someone who I think should be way more uh, well-known than he is. So Ralph Bunch was a an African-American diplomat, which was you know no, notable at the time. And he had served in the OSS and then had been worked for the State Department as part of the delegation at the San Francisco conference that established the United Nations. And then he went to work for the UN. And by the time the Congo crisis begins in 1960, he was intimately involved in the UN's sort of managing of what its role in these new independent countries would be. And Dag Hammarskjöld, the Secretary General, sent Ralph Bunch to Congo as the UN's representative to the independence ceremonies. But when the crisis suddenly broke out days after those ceremonies, Bunch then became the head of the UN mission there. And he's this fascinating character. And he left behind, I mean, fortunately for me, he left behind many letters and documents and his archives were a, a very rich source for me. And he, you know, he had this tension. He was a representative of the, U, of the UN, which was this neutral organization, but he was also an American. So he often found himself caught between, you know, the American foreign policy and UN policy, which over the course of the Congo crisis began to diverge. You know, as I was reading the book, particularly the first half, and my reaction almost was that the first half of the book could have been the Ralph Bunch story. I mean, some of the things that uh, he experienced and some of the things that he ended up doing were just amazing during this uh, very, very chaotic and dangerous period in the Congo. Yeah. And, and as I was hinting at, part of the wonderful thing for someone writing history decades later is that he he wrote these letters to his wife and his son and to colleagues back in New York at the UN. And so there was a, a rich paper trail there that allowed me to um, you know, recreate the crisis through, through his eyes. So tell us about Larry Devlin, how he became involved, and how those relationships developed over time. Yeah. So Devlin, Larry Devlin was the CIA station chief in Leopoldville at the time. He was 37 or 38 years old, and he had uh, served in Europe before that. Uh, his cover actually was a as a travel guide writer for um, Fodor's the, uh, the the travel guide series. Um, Eugene Fodor was, in fact, you know, working fairly closely with the CIA and allowing uh, his books to be used as his company to be used as cover. And Devlin arrived. In Congo, July 10th, 1960. That's, you know, 10 days after independence. In the thick of the crisis, the mutiny was going on. And very quickly, he became a key 
player in the Congolese political scene. He, backing up a bit, in January and February 1960, the Congolese held a roundtable with the Belgian government to negotiate the terms of independence. At that point, Devlin was at the U.S. Embassy in Brussels, and he recalls having the, the embassy held a cocktail party with the Congolese political leaders who were there. And he would later say that one name stood out there, all of these different leaders and people were having conversations. But the, the man who left the biggest impression on him was Mobutu. So that was the first time he had met him. And then sometime in later July or early or August 1960, he met Mobutu again, when Mobutu was head of the army and was sorting out some disturbance with troops in the street. But then where they really first became close was in September 1960. And what happens then is Lumumba's prime minister and Congo also had a president, a man named Joseph Kasavubu. And there was a dispute between them and each fired the other. Kasavubu fired Lumumba. Lumumba said, no, you can't fire me. I fire you. And so the two, the country's two top leaders had each fired one another. And into that void stepped Mobutu, who met with Devlin multiple times after this mutual firing. And as Devlin would later recall, Mobutu asked Devlin for permission, basically, to stage a coup and intervene and say, okay, I'm now in charge. Devlin was, you know, as I mentioned, I think 38 years old at the time, and said in so many words, yes, okay, and then handed him a briefcase of cash the next day that Mobutu had requested to pay off his officers. That was the beginning of a long and mutually beneficial relationship between Mobutu and Devlin that, you know, would see Mobutu be in power as the de facto leader. Then later, at the end of the Congo crisis, once he had established full control, he got rid of the president and made himself president, even though he was had been de facto in charge anyways as the power behind the throne. And then Mobutu stayed in power until 1997, actually. And at some point when Devlin retired from the agency, he was invited he, he he left the agency and worked for Maurice Templesman, the American diamond merchant, and became Templesman's man in Zaire. And and the reason he was hired for that was because he had Mobutu's ear. And that you know if you wanted anything, wanted to get anything done, you had to get Mobutu on your side. And Devlin had this very long and close relationship with him that began in 1960. And in fact, American diplomats would complain that Devlin, a retired CIA officer, had better access to Mobutu than they, the diplomats at the U.S. Embassy in Kinshasa, did. What was the Binza Group, and what role did it play? So the Binza Group was this informal caucus of Congolese leaders. At the center of it was Mobutu, but it also included um, Justin Bomboko, who was the foreign minister, Victor Nendaka, who was the head of the security services, and several others. And they were you know, you could debate when exactly they began, but let's say at some point in 1961, and they were the power brokers over the, over the, until around, I think, 1965. Again, it's a little fuzzy exactly when you start and end it, but they, um, if you wanted to actually get something done, you, the Binza group would meet and decide. So yes, there would be, you know, people in various ministerial posts. Yes, there was a president, Kasavubu, but the real power lay in this informal group. And it was named for the the neighborhood of Leopoldville, where they all, or most of them, lived. You know, this nice, hilly, suburban neighborhood uh, called Binza. And Devlin became sort of an informal advisor to them. And, and often the way that group worked is they would meet together, come up with a decision, and then inform Devlin and, and some other Western representatives of their decision and and sort of run it by them and get feedback. But it was a, a small, powerful cabal that eventually Mobutu did away with altogether. But um, for a few years there, it was it was the uh, the key decision making locus in Congo. Stuart, early on, you mentioned that at the beginning of the uh, crisis, a couple of the provinces. Uh, declared independence and tried to secede. Clearly, the principal of these, the most important, was Katanga. Would you talk a little bit about Katangan secession and how important that was for stability in the rest of the Congo? 
Yeah. So on July 11th, so that's, you know, independence was on June 30th. On July 11th, Katanga seceded, announced that it was independent. It was mineral rich. That's an important thing to know about it. It had a large white Belgian settler population there, unlike the rest of the Congo, which largely did not, with a few exceptions. And it was led by a fierce opponent of Lumumba named Moise Chambe, who was very you know, conservative and pro-Belgian and different from Lumumba in almost every respect. And this was a major crisis because this province was the source, the, the principal revenue source for the entire country. And so just a little over a week after independence, the economic engine of the country was detached from it. What happened next was that the, the United Nations peacekeepers come in and they're able to go to every single province except Katanga. And so this is devastating to Lumumba. He needs to have that province brought back into the fold. But the United Nations, you know, fearful that they'll be met with resistance if they enter, refuses to do so. And so that was a big dispute between the United Nations and Lumumba, a big source of dispute personally between Lumumba and Ralph Bunch, and, you know, would take years to be finally resolved. And and there had long been this tension between the province and the center. And under colonial rule, it was sort of, there was a bit of administrative separation. And this really came to a head in the Congo crisis. And, and that, and it was also the site of Lumumba's death, uh, which we, we can talk about as we go on. Yeah. I think that's the next question. Without giving everything away, would you touch briefly on Lumumba's arrest, incarcer- incarceration, flight, re-arrest, torture, and death? Yeah, so there, as you mentioned, a lot of different steps there. So Lumumba was under house arrest. He had been deposed as prime minister, Mobutu's in charge, and Lumumba was under house arrest in the prime minister's residence. And surrounding his residence were, were two circles. One was on the inside was United Nations peacekeepers protecting him from outside threats. And then there was an outside ring of Congolese soldiers you know, who answered to Mobutu, preventing Lumumba from leaving and preventing others from getting in. Lumumba is endlessly frustrated being cooped up under house arrest. He wants to come back to power, but he's not able to rally his supporters. He's cut off from the rest of the world. And so on November 27th, 1960, he makes the fateful decision to escape house arrest, which uh, he he crouches down in the back of a servant's car as they drive through. And miraculously, neither the UN troops nor the Congolese troops uh, notice him. And so he passes through undetected and then begins this escape on by car where he's trying to go to Stanleyville, his political stronghold. And he hopes that once there, he can reestablish support, start a, you know, reestablish his government as sort of a government in a different part of the Congo where he has more support. He is eventually captured a few days after escaping with help from the CIA, which worked with Mobutu to organize the search party. He's flown back to Leopoldville, roughed up, and, and you can see that, you know, the videos are on YouTube, slapped around by soldiers as Mobutu watches him smiling. Again, there we have the real, you know, betrayal of personal level between these two former friends. You know, now one is you know, tormenting the other. And he's thrown in a military prison. And what I found really interesting is that the timing of what was going back, what was happening back in Washington proved to be really crucial. So this is January 1961. You may remember that was when President Eisenhower's term was ending and President Kennedy's was about to begin. And this really kicked off a flurry of concern in Congo on both the Congolese side and on the part of Devlin. They were worried that the new Kennedy administration would have a sort of softer line toward Congo, be more open to the idea of Lumumba coming back in power in some form. They, by contrast, viewed him as you know, irredeemable and dangerous and you know, should not be allowed by any means to, to retake power. And so then what happens, and as you, I'll try not to give the whole thing away, but Devlin learns from a source that Lumumba is about to be transferred to a province where he will certainly die. It was 
either South Kasai, which is the other secession process, province we haven't talked about, or Katanga. And he decides to sit on this information and not keep headquarters in the loop. Why? Because he assumed, almost certainly correctly, that had he told his superiors back in Washington about what was about to happen, he would be told to intervene and stop this explosive transfer from happening, something that would surely lead to the death of Lumumba, surely inflame the situation and not be helpful. And so he doesn't do that. He, he doesn't tell his superiors. And even as he's updating them about other things, which we know because we, we have the cables. And so then Lumumba is bound and thrown on a plane and flown to Elizabethville, the capital of Katanga. And, um, you know, suffice it to say, things do not turn out well for him there. And I'll let, I'll let listeners uh, you know, read the book to, to learn more. Well, let's finish off with Doug Hammarskjöld's fourth and final trip to the Congo to try to finally resolve the Katanga issue and his own death. Yeah, so Doug Hammarskjöld, a Swedish diplomat who became Secretary General of the UN, was extremely involved in a way that's hard to imagine today uh, in the twists and turns of the Congo crisis. This, the UN peacekeeping mission there was unprecedented in size and scope. Never before had the United Nations tried to restore order to an entire country. Its previous missions had been you know, monitoring a ceasefire or a truce. And he really felt that his whole secretary generalship was on the line. The Congo operation was not going well. As I mentioned, UN troops had not been allowed to enter Katanga. That eventually changed in, I think, September 1960. But they were, you know, they were, they were never able to really establish control and to evict the Belgian officers who were forming the officer, officer corps of the provincial army there. And so at one point, the UN, sort of unbeknownst to Hammarskjöld, launches this shock and awe type operation to finally seize control and and kick out the Belgians. It goes very poorly. And so Hammarskjöld flies to Katanga to orchestrate a truce. He actually flies to Ndola, which is a city just outside the border in what was then northern Rhodesia, now um, Zambia. And as listeners may know, his plane crashes, and it's become this mystery for decades what exactly happened. And there are whole books written about this, which I encourage people to read. I ultimately, you know, it's unknowable exactly why his plane crashed. And there are many conspiracy theories about, you know, whether the various Belgian or, you know, sort of uh, white mercenaries were involved. I'm pretty skeptical of those conspiracy theorists, to be honest. In 1961, Planes crashed all the time. The most likely explanation is pilot error, but we'll never know. And yeah, his death was you know a shock to the world, a shock to the United Nations, and really marked the end of an era because Hammarskjöld was the last secretary general, and arguably the first, who really had an independent diplomatic profile who could, you know, had moral authority, who could, you know, become an international trouble, troubleshooter. Future ones would be much less powerful, in part, arguably, because of the failure of the Congo crisis, where, I mean, the Soviets vowed never again to let such an operation take place. They hadn't exercised their veto. But so the, the Congo crisis not only marked uh, the death of Dag Hammarskjöld, but also sort of the death of the UN's ambitions at the time. Well, it's a fascinating read. I found it to be a real page turner. And I recommend it to serious historians and people just interested in learning more about this amazing story. And I want to thank Stuart Reed for a wonderful interview. Thanks so much, Jimmy. And we didn't even get to talk about the uh, the poison plot, but um, <laughs> readers can see that. I'll have to read the book. Thanks so much for having me. <laughs>